Hi everybody, welcome back, glad you could tune in again. So we've been thinking about marriage and about divorce and remarriage and we've talked about a range of topics and you've had three quite lengthy uh, devotions in this series already talking among other things about the significance of marriage as a divinely ordained institution for families to structure their life together for the raising of children, for uh, the good of society as a whole and talking about the place that divorce might have in that uh, context, uh, not as a desirable thing in itself, but as something there to protect the victims of marriages that go terribly, terribly wrong when one party or the other breaks their covenant commitments. And then we talked in the third video about the specific grounds upon which uh, divorce may be legitimate. Now, there's a lot more to think about in uh, this uh, whole area of uh, reflection and we're going to get to some particularly practical what ifs and what about sort of situations but before we do that I want in what I hope will be a slightly shorter video uh, to just to pick up a few uh, more uh, basic biblical observations which also have something to teach us about the background against which uh, this biblical teaching uh, appears and what I want to do today is simply to look at the four passages in the gospels where the subject of divorce uh, comes up most significantly, and actually remarriage comes up as well, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, also in Mark 10 and Luke 16. I'm just going to read them to you and then make a couple of observations about the obvious differences that you'll observe among them. So without further ado, Matthew 5, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What I want to draw your attention to there, that's verses 31 and 32 of Matthew 5, is verse 32, whoever divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, the so-called Matthean exception, the except for sexual immorality, appears there in Matthew 5. And it also appears in Matthew 19, uh, verse 9, uh, again at the end of a, a section uh, talking about this subject. Uh, verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And we talked in the previous video about that as the exception for sexual immorality is one component of the biblically uh, legitimate grounds for divorce. But you observe also that this subject is addressed in the parallel passages or in similar passages um, in Mark uh, 10 and here's how it goes verse, verses 11 and 12 whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her and if she divorces her husband and marries another she commits adultery no except for sexual immorality there there's no exception apparently in Mark's gospel and similarly, in Luke 16, verse 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. No exception there either. So what are we to do with this? Uh, Matthew uh, records Jesus highlighting uh, a, a context in which divorce is legitimate, sexual immorality. Both Mark and Luke do not record him highlighting that exception. And as you can imagine, there have been scholars uh, throughout the history of the church, and particularly in recent uh, decades and centuries, that have uh, suggested here that there is some significant contradiction, or uh, that this is uh, an indication of the human and provisional and non-authoritative character of the Gospels. In other words, here we've got contradictions in the Bible, and this is just more proof that we shouldn't take the Bible too seriously. Well, I hope I don't have to spend too long um, telling you what I think of that point of view. It is not the case that here we have contradictions in the Bible. It is not the case, certainly, that this is grounds for not taking the Bible seriously. In fact, it tells us something very significant about the character of Scripture and about the character of the society into which Jesus was speaking. First, on the character of Scripture, obviously it's not the case that Jesus says everything that needs to be said about every subject on every occasion on which he speaks about that subject or in every instance where his words on that subject are recorded in scripture. A lot of what Jesus says on different situations is determined by the context in which he's speaking. And the exception appears in Matthew's gospel. 
Therefore, it appears in Scripture. Therefore, it's authoritative. The fact that he doesn't mention it in the words recorded in Luke and Mark do not somehow undermine the testimony that our Lord Jesus gives uh, in Matthew's Gospel. To put it another way, Scripture functions as a whole. It's intended by God for us to receive as an integrated package, so to speak. Uh, and it's not for us to play one part off against another, as if though you know, we can pick and choose which bits we like, or as if we can uh, decide because there is some superficial non-identity between the phrases or the words in different places, therefore it's really a um, uh, loosely constructed human document that isn't to be taken seriously. The scriptures as a whole testify that the existence of sexual immorality in a marriage relationship is sufficient grounds for divorce. Jesus does so in Matthew's Gospel. The fact that he doesn't do so in Mark and Luke as well is not particularly relevant. However, the fact that he doesn't mention it in Mark and Luke may suggest a couple of other features of first century life into which these documents were written that are worth paying attention to. Uh, the first is that it seems that in Matthew, uh, sorry, in Mark and in Luke, as it's recorded here, it's possible for Jesus and the evangelists to assume that people were aware of the widespread recognition that divorce existed and that sexual immorality gave good grounds for divorce. Both those features of the ancient first century culture uh, seem to be present. And the fact that Mark and Luke don't mention them is reckoned by the most reliable interpreters of scripture and commentators and so on to be evidence that the exception clause found in Matthew's gospel was widely understood and recognized. And indeed, when we look at in detail at the Old Testament text, we may uh, notice this, certainly, that uh, adultery and sexual unfaithfulness generally does give grounds for divorce. And moreover, uh, it's striking that the reality of divorce itself is, so to speak, taken for granted in first century culture. It's not, in other words, that all this legislation about divorce that we've been highlighting somehow suggests that it's a good and wonderful thing. No, quite the contrary. It's a terrible thing, but it should have to exist at all. It's a terrible thing that marriage relationships that ought to be for life get to the point where there's legitimate need for divorce. And it's certainly terrible for a whole bunch of other reasons if they end when there's no good reason for divorce. And what that serves to highlight is a fundamental point which needs to be underscored throughout what we're thinking about uh, on this topic. And with this, I want to close this devotion. There will always be times when marriages go through bumpy patches, always. Even the best of marriages have rough days. And our instinct in all those circumstances ought to be to seek to preserve and indeed to strengthen the relationship in spite of and perhaps even because of those rough times. We need to live with the reality of human sinfulness, not by fleeing to the hills, taking the easy escape route as though somehow that's what God wants. That's not what God wants. Remember, the Lord who wrote uh, these words by his spirit in the Gospels also wrote Genesis 2, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And that must be our instinct. It may be the case that Half or so of all marriages contracted in 2021 will sometime, sometime end in divorce. But that must not be the default assumption or the background against which we approach those difficulties when they come, which they will, in our marriages. Now that is not at all to undermine the biblical grounds for legitimate divorce. It's certainly not to suggest that somebody who's being ill-treated or who has, uh, whose spouse has had an affair should somehow feel obligated to bear with that ill treatment. Quite the contrary. It is to suggest that in the first century, as in the 21st century, the tragic reality of divorce taking place more often than it should do 
is all around us. And as Christians, we are called to stand against that. Let our instinct be, Genesis 2, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Let us try to think of ways to strive towards that together, to bear with one another in love. And divorce, well, let it be restricted for those terrible, catastrophic cases that actually warrant it. I think that's probably enough for now. We'll continue reflecting on this subject in future days. For now, the Lord bless you.